Hello, everybody. I'm Mike Fitzsimmons, and this is Let's Talk. And on this edition, we're talking politics a little bit. Actually, we're talking judicial politics with Tracy Staub, who's a candidate for the a Division Three seat in the Appellate Court of Eastern Washington. Tracy, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. Nice to have you with us. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the the court that you wish to serve on. You've been involved in a variety of things, both as a practicing attorney and as well as uh, I think what twenty seven years is that right mm-hmm. that you've been involved in the in the practice of law and on the bench in yes. part. All right, yes. but this is a different move for you, a different direction. Talk about the Court of Appeals. All right, thank How you. How important is it? The Court of Appeals is going to be, it is important, and it's going to be very important in the coming years. Um, so there are there are basically four levels of court in the state of Washington for state courts. Um, at, you know, we have the misdemeanor courts, which are municipal and, and district courts. Um, when people get traffic infractions, that's where they go. Misdemeanors, driving offenses, DUIs, misdemeanor domestic violence, shoplifting charges, trespass charges, those are all processed through the district and municipal courts. Above them uh, is superior court. That's your court of general jurisdiction, and that's gonna be your big cases, your real estate cases, your probate cases, um, anything that has equity involved in it. That's, that's where most of the cases are filed is in superior court. Uh, when somebody wants to appeal a case from Superior Court, then that case goes up to the Court of Appeals. Uh, the Court of Appeals is a statewide court, but it is divided into three divisions. So Division One is sits in Seattle, Division Two sits in Tacoma, and Division Three sits in Eastern Washington in Spokane and covers 20 counties in Eastern Washington. Literally the Cascades. Literally east the Cascades the east. So geographically, it's the largest of the three divisions. Um, division th- or the Court of Appeals uh, handles, and Division Three handles about 90% of the appeals from Superior Court. And then the Supreme Court sits above the Court of Appeals. Of course, that's uh, in Olympia. There are nine justices there. And they take, they pick and choose. So they take about 10% of the appeals that come up, and they get to cherry pick and decide which ones are interesting and have broad ramifications throughout the state. So the Court of Appeals is the workhorse of the appellate cases, and they decide the bulk of the appeals. And folks think that if you don't like the outcome in a trial if in a court of original jurisdiction, that you can appeal that and get a new trial in the Court of Appeals. It doesn't work that way. You do not take on any uh, testimony. No. Nope. You take the trial record from the lower court, and really what you're looking at is whether or not the judge in the lower court applied the law correctly or not. Right to the facts that have been decided. So it's considered an error-correcting court. Um, There are no juries at the Court of Appeals. There are no witnesses. There are no trials. Um, Instead, the record is transmitted to the Court of Appeals. And in the old days, when I used to clerk there, we'd get a big box, a big banker's box. And it had all the records and all the exhibits. And as a law clerk, my job was to dig through all of them, read everything, read the briefs, read the cases, and then kind of harmonize it and put it all together in a memorandum for the judges and say here's the case um, in an objective fashion but yes um, the attorneys present arguments at the court of appeals somewhat like you'll see at the supreme court level but there's no retrial it's simply application of the law to the facts and deciding whether there was an error so in a court of original jurisdiction you have the trier of fact uh, which is the jury usually, usually. If, if, if the judge sits alone, it's a bench trial, and mm-hmm. the, the judge is the trier of fact, as well as the trier of law. Correct. And the uh, appellate court looks at the trial of law. Mm-hmm. The facts are set up and assumed to be the facts, and they're not argued about. Um, and when when a, a, a judge, for example, in a, in a uh, lower court trial um, sustains an objection or overrules an objection, that's one of the things we're talking about. Virtually every single one of the calls of balls and strikes and Mm -hmm. instructions and such of that nature all go to the to the Court of Appeals. Correct. Yes. So that's this is why this is this why this is so so particularly important. Thus then it's very critical that people who serve on the Court of Appeals have significant trial experience Mm -hmm. to be able to do that and you were a prosecutor you were you practiced a law on a variety of, uh, of different fronts, so you qualify certainly in that regard. How important is that? It's very important. Um, having that broad range of experience, I mean, think of um, 
anybody who has worked for a supervisor who never did the work below, if you've ever worked for a supervisor who's never done your job and really doesn't understand your job, how frustrating that can be. So um, having worked, so to speak, in the trenches uh, and getting a realistic view of what that looks like and then going up to basically being elevated to a supervisor position. With that experience, you bring that with you. You understand the realities of what it's like to work down there. Um, not only is the Court of Appeals an error correcting court, but even if the court decides that an error was made, oftentimes the next step is to decide whether that error requires reversal, because not every error requires a new trial. Right. They don't guarantee a perfect trial, they just guarantee a fair trial. Especially in criminal cases mm -hmm. under the Sixth Amendment, that's a requirement. Right. And if that if that fails very often, so the Court of Appeals could either uh, affirm mm -hmm. what the lower court did, mm -hmm. even if there were minor errors, mm -hmm. uh, could reverse, as you mentioned, or could remand. Right. Which is to send it back for something to more be, decisions to be made to be uh, um, finished, if you will. Right. 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 So that's what you do, and uh, there are several judges on the Court of Appeals? There are, Not yes. just a single. There are 20 judges altogether, I believe. There are five judges in Division Three. Um, Division Three, which is all of Eastern Washington, is actually divided into three districts. Um, district One, which is the district I'm running for, is six counties. So voters from Okanagan, Ferry, Stevens, Ponderay, Spokane, and Lincoln County will be voting on this particular position. But I will, if I am elected, I would be sitting on cases from all of eastern Washington. But anytime there's an appeal, it's a panel of three judges. Right. And the three Initially. Judge, yes. They can, you can require that the entire the, the bench. entire bench and I don't know if they I don't think they do that at the Court of Appeals that's called an en banc right. and I've never seen it at the Court of Appeals now when you go up to the Supreme Court it's always what they consider an en banc which is all nine justices oh, decide yeah. the case right. when you go to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals which is where I spent a lot of time they do have a three judge panel and then you can request an en banc review which right. is a panel of 11 judges and but those are federal circuits yes those are federal circuits not to be confused with state right and there are s several of those as well. Mm -hmm. But you have, uh, as I understand it, you had uh, what is somewhere around 70 cases mm -hmm. in front of the Ninth. Yes. At a time in which the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals was uh, perhaps the singular most overturned court. Yes. So <laughs> you had to be pretty careful about uh, your arguments and, and about your, uh, your, your briefs with respect to that to, to, to uh, prevail. Yes. It was, it was a wonderful experience I have to say it was a level of practice that a few people get to experience and enjoy um, and to say that all I did was appeals at the Court of Appeals Ninth Circuit I flew over once a month to Seattle or Portland and sometimes San Francisco and got to argue cases there um, it was intellectually challenging and I loved it um, so but you know for some people appellate work is very unique uh, even among attorneys and judges there's a lot of attorneys that hate it. They, my husband is a trial attorney for one, and he hates it. <laughs> he says it's like right, doing homework for a living. Oh, my gosh. Um, but for me, it's like putting a puzzle together or opening a good book uh, and just seeing where the evidence and the, the law takes you. So I, I enjoy it. But from the standpoint of qualifications, mm -hmm. that is an immense experience record. Yes. And uh, you, uh, in this particular contest, are far, uh, far more uh, um, advanced down that road than your opponent. Yes. In addition to my work at the Ninth Circuit, um, I was an appellate attorney in the state system for several years. And then even before that, I clerked at the Court of Appeals for four years. For, so I worked underneath a judge um, and doing basically the grunt work for the judge, like I had mentioned earlier, going through the record. And, and, uh, and that's a great position because it's neutral. I, I don't have an agenda. I'm not advocating for a particular person or a party. Uh, and, and it's like getting a master's degree in the law. It was really a wonderful experience, but it really helped me to, um, increase the level of my writing. And um, I, I really appreciated that time there. And, and your judicial reasoning. Yes. I mean, you uh, studied a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, cases uh, in, and briefs uh, in, in a variety of different areas and become f rather broadly familiar where oftentimes uh, um, attorneys and even judges 
do not have that uh, that uh, wealth of experience. Yeah, That's it, important. It was. It was, you know, a new box every week. And it was, you open up the box and it was uh, easements or you open up the box and it was civil rights or you open up the box and it was class action or, you know, insurance law. Water or, rights. or Yeah, water rights. Things of that nature, it, yeah. It was incredible. So yeah. I enjoyed it. You also then, in the process, develop something of a judicial philosophy as you look at this whole thing. <laughs> now, uh, I, I should mention to our audience that it, it isn't possible uh, for Tracy to s discuss specific cases or how she might rule on specific issues. That would be inappropriate. But it is uh, appropriate for her to be able to share with you a judicial philosophy, uh, and uh, that is generally her overall view of the law and its importance in, uh, in the application to uh, various things uh, uh, that uh, occur in our society whether it be economics, whether it be culture, whatever it happens to be. And we are living in a most interesting time. Talk about your, your philosophy. Sure. Um, I, my philosophy, um, I, you know, I think as, as Chief Justice Roberts said when he was being confirmed to the U.S. Supreme Court, he said, we are umpires. We call balls and strikes. Um, we are not the player in the game. Um, and we shouldn't insert ourselves into that position. Uh, and even Justice Ginsburg said, um, we are not legislators and we would be very bad at being legislators. So we should not be legislating from the bench. We should uh, understand the limits of what we are supposed to do um, and apply the law that has been written by the legislators and executed by the executive branch to determine if the law has been followed or if the law has violated the Constitution. That's our job. It's narrow and it's focused, and we need to stay within those bounds. But while that is the ideal, we mm -hmm. do know that we have on the bench activist judges who indeed do legislate from the bench, mm -hmm. who actually have uh, created from, from uh, uh, virtually nothing various legal theories that uh, have decided uh, cases that, that, uh, that make it very puzzling in light of the fact that it's an absence of of uh, any underlying uh, uh, legislation mm -hmm. that would require a determination of the constitutionality thereof. And that's, that's something that, uh, as, uh, as someone trained in the law, frustrates me when I see that sort of thing happen. And it happens on both sides of the ideological aisle, if you it will. Does. It's not It's not uh, indigenous to one or another, right. but it's wrong. It is. Fundamentally. It is fundamentally wrong. I'm, I, I, even as my position now as a judge, I'm not elected to be a legislator. That's not my job. And I need to constantly remind myself of that. There is a better place to create laws, and that is through the give and take of legislation. That's the constitutional That's the constitution. situs for creating laws, not Absolutely. the courts. Absolutely. Um, and I'm not in a good place to do that. Um, I don't have the resources that the legislator has. I don't have... Um, the information that they have. I don't have the push and pull of the constituents. Nothing of that. So, absolutely. Well, as we look, you mentioned the Supreme Court and Justice Ginsburg, who just passed away. Uh, as we uh, look toward the uh, filling of that that position, we're seeing a tremendous amount of partisan politics I attempting know. to influence the outcome. And the, the public is, uh, I think, somewhat um, uh, less than uh, uh, um, completely uh, understanding of what is going on there. They were, I, I, th I think that they think that like electing a senator or a member of the House or, or a, f a president, that this is all partisan stuff, and it really is not supposed to be, which is precisely why you running for this seat must run nonpartisan. Correct. Your, your political persuasion, whatever that might be, is not relevant. It's not relevant. I don't ask people when they come before me if they are a Republican or a Democrat, and it doesn't matter. Uh, I treat them the same regardless of their political affiliations, regardless of their background. You know, I, none of that matters to a judge when they come before the court, and it shouldn't matter to the voters because it's not going to influence my decision making. You know, uh, as a voter, and I know that uh, over the years that uh, the public has been perplexed, if you will, mm -hmm. by, by um, persons running in nonpartisan uh, campaigns for, for uh, a, a court uh, um, seat. Mm -hmm. And they really don't necessarily know uh, how quite to deal with those. Even well-educated individuals just still uh, oftentimes will uh, um, 
vote for the incumbent because they don't have any way of or pr process by which they can assess a mm -hmm. candidate for office. How do you want or what criteria do you want them to look at when they look at you? Okay. And, and oftentimes, and I know it's very hard to vote for judges. We're nonpartisan and we can't give you uh, an answer on how we would decide a case. So what does that give the voters? Uh, I tell people, choose a judge the way you would choose a job applicant. If you were to hire this person to do a job, what, what qualities would you look for? And so you would look for knowledge of the law, you would look for relevant experience, you would look for integrity, a reputation in the community for having integrity, uh, and, and you would look for suitability for the job. These are the factors that the bar associations look at when they rate judges. Now, um, one of the things that is available to the voters are what we call ratings. And these are not endorsements. These are individual bar associations that take the time to dig through a candidate's background. They call dozens of references. Um, they, they look at writing samples, and then they have a panel, and they do a pretty intensive interview. These are competency yes. things, not, yes. not, not, not I agree with her or I don't agree yes. with her. These are competency. Exactly. And they're just as likely to rate you as being not qualified to sit on the bench as they, you know, they will come out with the negative as easily as they will come out with the positive and you have no control <laughs> over that. So when you submit yourself to a bar rating, you put yourself out there. And uh, if you're not qualified, you're going to have to deal with that rating. Um, so I've done that with seven bar associations for this particular job. Four of them have rated me exceptionally well qualified for this position, which is the highest rating. And then three of them have rated me well qualified. So all seven of those ratings are out there. And again, they're not endorsements. That is a group of judges and citizens and attorneys who have taken the time to really dig into my qualifications. To put it another way, there are all kinds of pilots. There are very good pilots mm -hmm. and there are adequate pilots. But yes. the bottom line is, if you're going to fly, you want the best pilots right. you can get. Yes, right? exactly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, and so they rate the pilots, not necessarily... Uh, because of uh, what what these people do, but just simply on the basis of competency. And that is your assurance in the end, right? Right. So if you're going to study any judicial candidate, not just uh, your particular mm -hmm. race, but any judicial candidate, you should look at the competency issue, all right? Right. How, what kind of experience do they have? Uh, you know, people who have been before them as a judge, what do they say about them? Are they thorough? Do they do the job correctly? L take a look at the at the appeals rate from their court. I mean, do every, does everybody who goes before this person always appeal the case? Not always do they do that. Right. You know, and, and if they don't, then that means it was a pretty good job done by the trial court. Uh, you know, th those sorts of things. Those are the things that you have to weigh. Now, we don't vet candidates, even even uh, pr persons who are running for you know political offices, very thoroughly anymore. Mm -hmm. We used to do a lot more of that, mm -hmm. but in this day and age, and social media and what have you. Uh, we have this tendency to sort of uh, go with what appears to be the popular flow and not think yeah. very deeply about these things. Right. It's kind of dangerous, don't you think? Yes, everybody's a meme. A meme, yeah. Um, and it is. It's it's very yeah surface level and not in depth thinking on that. Um, and people still come toward me and say, "Well, I know that you're nonpartisan, but you know, are you really Republican? Are you really Democrat?" And I think they get used to that, even with some of our city politics who are nonpartisan, but have a tendency to be supported by one party or the other. Um, and for judicial candidates, I stress really strongly that we really are nonpartisan and we're trying to stay that way just to maintain the integrity of the judicial system. Uh, it's hard when you're elected because you have to submit yourself to voters and they want to know information about you which is completely justified but um, maintaining the integrity of the bench means that we are not subject to one party's philosophy or another's. Yet when we look at the Supreme Court uh, a seat to be filled, yeah, it comes down to as this person uh, you know, uh, a liberal is this person, mm -hmm. a conservative, as though somehow or other uh, they would interpret the facts before them in appeal based on their own political point of view and which party benefits from my decision. That would be the furthest thing uh, from f from fair and reasonable that could possibly uh, be imagined. Uh, yet there is a huge amount of pressure and expectation in that regard. And as we will see in the in the uh, weeks that unfold, particularly with respect to this fast uh, fast track uh, yes. appointment, that there's going to be a lot of that. And I, may, I imagine, uh, Judge, that, it's, it, that it makes it difficult for you 
because that's the the standard by which you're you're being measured to a certain extent whether you like it or not right uh, the benefit is that it's really going to bring judicial uh, qualifications to the forefront everybody's going to be watching this nomination process okay. in the next couple of weeks and for anybody who's watching it they're going to realize that whoever that a candidate is whoever's proposed as the nominee is not going to answer questions about how they would decide a case and is going to be very conservative and very liber uh, limited in how they answer questions um, that's historical throughout all of the nominations they're very um, concerned and, and conservative in the questions that they will answer so we're all going to get a crash course in judicial nominations and elections in the next couple of weeks yeah i don't know necessarily that the uh, that the curriculum will be as accurate as it yeah. should be either that uh, that troubles me but in in coming up with a standard by which a voter would uh, would assess you mentioned the uh, the uh, bar associations mm -hmm. and, and and that that's one that's one criteria mm -hmm. uh, but um it seems to me that if you're going to select somebody, let's say, for example, you're going to select somebody to be an umpire for the Major League Baseball, right? Right. Um, and, and we're going to go to the World Series, right? We're going to go to the, to the playoffs of the World Series, which is essentially the appellate level of the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. so to speak, at the, in this, in this uh, um, uh, example. You're going to want the, the referees who have been there and done that who've been reliable whom the teams know will call the balls and strikes fair right. and clearly and right. accurately right yes uh nobody is going to go in there you know wearing their favorite uh, you know their red Sox hat they're not going to be doing <laughs> that right they're just not going to be doing that uh, that and, and and in a way in a way that's a good metaphor for the way people should look at judges they want to take a look at okay this is an important job. Right. I don't necessarily understand the mechanics of this job as a voter, but I do understand this. This is a complicated job that's going to take somebody who has done this job and done it well. Right. And if you, if you have that as a candidate, that should be, from an instinctive standpoint, that should be your choice. It really should be. And your, your, oops, your analogy is correct. Um, this is the playoffs. Essentially, the Court of Appeals is the yeah, playoffs. Yeah. Supreme Court is the World Series. Court of Appeals is going to be the playoffs. And you want an umpire in that position with a reputation for doing the right call. And if you have somebody in there who's never been an umpire before, you wouldn't start them in the playoffs. That's right. So having built a reputation and having the experience um, of calling balls and strikes in a trial then going up to the playoffs is not such a big step and it, it gives voters the um the satisfaction of knowing that this is somebody that that we can trust but but more than that beyond beyond just that part we all as citizens want to know that when we have to go to court if it's for a, a, a criminal charge or for a civil issue whatever the case may be that we're going to get the best quality fairest form of justice mm -hmm. yes right absolutely. that doesn't always happen and that's why we have a court of appeals, right? If we have a partisan judge or a judge that has a, a you know, a, a, a sort of slipshot at the, uh, um, at the uh, uh, original jurisdiction level, trial court level, um, we want to be sure that we make it right before this thing is said and done, right? right. Yes. And I think that's important. If you ever, and we all, you know, maybe we all say, well, I, I don't expect to ever have to go to court and, you know, I'm a good guy and I don't, don't ever plan on getting arrested and all that sort of thing. So it really doesn't apply to me. But it does. It does. The reality of it is that if for some reason you are uh, charged with a crime you didn't commit, you want to have the very best defense you can get. You want to have the very the, the fairest possible court you can get. You want to have the fairest possible jury selection. You want all that sort of thing. Or if you get sued or you need to sue, mm -hmm. you want to be sure that your case is going to be, uh, by, be handled by a court of original jurisdiction with the most competent mm -hmm. uh, process possible. And wherever errors are, you want to know that there's going to be a second set of eyes on that if an appeal takes place. And I think that's a comfort. It that, is, yeah. that folks need to uh, appreciate that you can provide. You know, not only if it's my case or your case, but understand that at the Court of Appeals, they set precedent. So the decisions that they make will not affect just the case before it, but will also impact cases down the road that have similar issues and similar facts. So it might not impact you directly, but it will, it will shape policies and procedures 
that will affect everybody around us. And for instance, I think about um, the civil rights movement that's going on right now and the calls for um, criminal justice reform. A lot of those issues will eventually trickle up to the Court of Appeals and be decided at the Court of Appeals level. Um, so that's going to shape policies and procedures for the next generations, whether it's your case or not. So that's why this, the Court of Appeals is, is very important in this election. Yeah, uh, precedent is a key aspect of the law. There's a Latin statement called uh, words of stare decisis, let mm -hmm. the decision stand. Yes. And you want to be sure that the court understands that your case is like the one that they had before and that they rule the same way on it rather than go off into outer space with, exactly. a, different, with a different kind of ruling. All these things are at play here, and it's sad that, to, to, that the expectations of voters very often are, are um, just simply um, misplaced in light of the fact that they don't have a handle on that. So part of your job, I suppose, as a jurist, uh, as a candidate certainly, is to educate. Yes, absolutely. So, and, and unfortunately, our ability to get out there and talk to voters has been, has been hampered at every yeah. angle in this case because of the pandemic. Usually COVID. my calendar would be filled with events going to um, you know, events and parades and community events and, and getting a chance to meet with voters and it, it just hasn't happened this year. So it's been particularly difficult to get the word out. So how are you coping with that, Judge? What are you doing? I'm how, learning, do, how do you I'm go about it? Zoom. <laughs> learning Zoom. <laughs> I'm learning Zoom and, and Teams and uh, WebEx and all of these video, um, you know, and the, the silver lining in all of this is that we are embracing technology that we were hesitant about before. And I think that even when this gets over, um, it's opening doors, forcing open doors uh, that we will continue to utilize after this is all over. This and technology is seeding itself in it our is. society in a variety of ways, including education. And it's no substitute for the, the in-person, but it's you know, if there was going to be something else, that's what we would go with. So, for instance, I run a DUI therapeutic court, and its model is frequent, consistent contact. It's a very intensive supervision level. Uh, lots of contact with people who are struggling with recovery and trying to get them to that point where we can kind of let them go and, and be on their own and be productive. Um, but when this whole COVID thing hit and everything shut down, that was the antithesis of our model. We have to have contact. So we started up almost right away with Zoom hearings. Um, I wanna say we started in April with every week we're on Zoom. So we meet all of our participants now by Zoom and frankly, they love it because they don't have to drive, take off time from work, drive all the way into town, fight for parking, come into court. You know, it's a three hour out of their day to come into court on a regular basis. Yeah. Now they, they jump into their truck during lunch and they show up to court. And we get that touch with them, we get that conversation with them, we talk to them about how they're doing, and then, hey, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Uh, and so in that sense, the silver lining of all of this has been that embracing of that technology. In many jurisdictions around the country, and I'll ask you if, it, if it's happening in, in this region and in Washington State as well, uh, the lockdowns that have occurred have basically shut down the courts for a while mm -hmm. where trials weren't taking place the way they were scheduled, mm -hmm. they've been postponed, and now they have been backlogged and you're getting a, 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 a for, for the courts of appeals, for example, uh, very little traffic for a while and soon there's going to be a tsunami. Yes. All right. Yes. Is that going to happen here? Um, I at the Court of Appeals or in the Municipal Court? In the Municipal Court, but also the Court of Appeals, because if there are appeals from these uh, various courts, they're, they're going to, uh, you know, they may be the same number that would ordinary, uh, ordinarily take place over time, but they're all going to come at once. Yes. So in Municipal Court, um, our ability to conduct court was hampered just like every other trial court you know we shut down for two months yeah. and had nothing going on except for your most basic um, hearings that are necessary when somebody gets arrested but everything else shut down so yes we're backlogged like superior court is as well yeah. now the court of appeals can conduct everything electronically so they've been cruising along but that's not to say that this backlog tsunami is there, there's a volume coming it's coming <laughs> So again, you know, it's another reason for having a judge there with a lot of experience because it's going to take somebody who can make those quick decisions and decide the case 
and get on to the next case without creating a, a further backlog. Um, you know, I mean, age of case is actually something that judges look at. How long am I holding on to cases before making a decision? Because um, it's not just a speedy trial issue, it's a speedy resolution issue. People who are before the court deserve a decision in a timely sure, manner. Justice delayed is justice denied. Justice denied, yep. Uh, we have just a few minutes left here, so let me ask you, why? Why Tracy Staub? Why should we vote for Tracy Staub and place her on the Washington State Court of Appeals Division Three? Well, I think I can serve Eastern Washington with experience and leadership and passion for this particular position. Um, my passion comes from, as I've mentioned, working there as a young attorney um, 21 years ago as a law clerk. And uh, at the time that I was there, there had never been a female judge on the Court of Appeals. So this is my opportunity to kind of come full circle, come back to the court that I love and that where I started uh, and, and take a job doing work that I love. Uh, beyond that, I have the most experience, I'm the most experienced candidate. Uh, I have 27 years of legal experience, 10 years of my experience as a an attorney focused just on appeals. So I have worked on hundreds of appeals. Um, the last 11 years, I've been a trial court judge at the municipal court. And so as, as we've talked about here, I have that experience in the trenches to move up to that supervisory position and understand and know what it's like to be down there in that, in doing the hard work. Um, and then finally, leadership. I bring community leadership. I've been involved with my community for years. I've been on boards, including the Spokane Regional Law and Justice Board, my local church board, my neighborhood councils. Um, and, and I volunteered for at-risk youth. I volunteered for food services. So my community is everything to me. And I bring that with me when I come to the Court of Appeals. So that's why I'm hoping that when you compare the candidates and look at my qualifications, that you'll consider me for the Court of Appeals. One last uh, matter. You mentioned that resources are difficult to come by in nonpartisan races. Yes. And you're absolutely right about that. So how can folks get in touch with you to learn more about you or to participate in your campaign, even though there's only a little more than a month left in the campaign? There's still plenty to do. Yes. So I have a website. It's www.judgestob.com. Stob is with two A's. Everybody always pronounces it incorrectly or spells it incorrectly, but it's S-T-A-A-B. I tell people it's just like the car with a T, and then they go, oh, yeah. <laughs> just <like the> sob. <laughs> All right. We appreciate you joining us today. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Wish you good luck. She is Tracy Staub, <laughs> Washington State uh, Court of Appeals candidate for the Division Three seat. Now that's it for Let's Talk. I'm Mike Fitzsimmons. Thank you for joining us.